Welcome back to another episode of Flawless Plan Garage, where once again, we are going to be hammering home the age-old truism, there's never time to do it right, but there's always time to do it twice. <sighs> Except I thought I did it right this time. But I didn't. Stay tuned. Alrighty, so what we are doing today is diagnosing and trying to see what went wrong with the engine that I built for my old Cadillac Escalade. So to review the flawless plan, what I did was buy a used LQ9 that was, you know, not in very good shape, halfway torn down, completely tore it the rest of the way down, checked everything out, and rebuilt it. We did, uh, kept the pistons, but did new piston rings, did a quickie hone, Miked the crank, checked everything out, uh, did new bearings for the cam, new bearings for the crank, did a truck Norris cam on the, did trunnion upgrades on the rockers, but otherwise, you know, left it mostly stock, just sort of a cam upgrade, kept the heads, did springs, so cam and springs basically, and everything else pretty much stock. Plastic aged all the bearings, everything checked out really good, everything was within spec, but during the course of the tuning process, getting up and running with the new cam, uh, it lost oil pressure. And it still had oil pressure when cold, but when it got hot, the oil pressure would drop to 20 PSI at idle, and then with RPMs, it would not increase. So something was definitely wrong. And then while I was noticing that, testing that, uh, trying to check things out and see if this was actually a legit problem, uh, the oil also filled with metal shavings. So I had been checking the oil periodically during the tuning process. I put maybe a hundred miles on it total um, while tuning it and it, things were improving. It was, it was running fairly well on the tune. Still had some work to do on it. Um, but even checking the oil during that, it wasn't consuming a lot of oil. The oil was still looking clean, but then yeah, it's, it's bad. So it's time to rip the thing out again. At least I'm getting better at this now. Certainly faster, anyway. Okay, tear down so far. Pretty much the usual things you would expect from something this bad looking. It's pretty sludgy in here. A lot of metal. Causal analysis. Some stuff I've been picking out of the pickup tube. And it is fibrous. This, to me, looks like shop towels. I have absolutely no idea how I could have screwed this up this badly. This is not my first rodeo, not my first engine rebuild, and I certainly understand the importance of cleaning, cleaning, and then cleaning. But from the looks of this, it looks like somehow I missed something, and there was a chunk of shop towel. That'll clog a pickup tube. That'll kill oil pressure. That'll kill a motor. Engineering, this is the bridge. Damage report. Well, okay, so initial theory about the cam bearings was wrong. Cam bearings are all still in position. Checked them with uh, a pick. None of them have spun. They all uh, still are connected to the oil galleries, oil galleys. But otherwise, and other than some wear, obviously, cam bearings I don't think are my problem. Definitely, okay, so we'll talk about the main bearings, show heavy wear, uh, for sure. A lot of damage there from the metal being in the oil, but uh, no evidence of any of them having, having been spun. The crank itself on those main journals, again, shows that, you know, a little bit of surfacey wear, but no other 
like real obvious damage that I can see so far. Haven't mic'd it yet. Rods, however, definitely spun at least a couple rods. So this I can feel and definitely feel with the fingernail. There's some heavy, heavy wear, um, especially on the either end. Those middle cylinders here are not as bad, but either end definitely spun the rod bearings. The uh, bearings all look terrible. Um, and I don't know if we'll be able to do this one-handed very well, but <laughs> the diameter of these bearings, like they're <laughs> the wrong diameter now. They're way too small now and definitely spun. You can see the way the tabs have been flattened on them. They weren't even sitting in the right orientation on the crank. Um, but yeah, number one and number eight for sure spun. Um, other ones, not quite as obvious, but there might have been some spinning of rod bearings and other ones too. So for the moment, I think my diagnosis is uh, bad assembly, foreign object damage, clogging up the oil pickup tube, spinning rod bearings on the bottom end. I think, I think that's what we've got. I think my next step then is determining uh, whether or not the crank can be saved. The cam does not appear to have, you know, big wear. There's, you know, there's a little bit of visible wear, but nothing you can feel. Um, I think nothing that wouldn't polish out or probably just work just fine as is. So uh, I think next step is the machine shop to see if these can be turned down, especially the rod journals. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, then actually see whether or not I can actually even buy uh, bearings for a turned down crank since parts are so hard to come by in some of this stuff right now. To be continued. Okay, after some time to think about this and doing a little looking at video and stuff, I think I know what I did wrong that caused the failure. Cut the wrong corner, of course. So I don't know if you saw it in the last video or not. I don't remember if I even had all of this on video, but um, I cleaned after doing my little honing in the cylinders with that three jaw hone, I wiped them out with this red cloth rag. Now these are not lint free. And in fact, they dump a ton of lint off of them, which I knew I had also run out of my lint free cloths after. So after I had wiped it down with the red rags, I went back with some blue paper shop towels like so, which are also not lint free, but I had thought, okay, as long as I'm careful with this, I use a lot of brake cleaner. Um, it should pick up and then clean off any of the lint left by the red towels. I think it didn't. I think it left a lot of the lint in the motor. And I think that's what eventually clogged the pickup tube. Now I am still out of my lint-free wipes, but I have coffee filters, which I learned from Humble Mechanic, make excellent alternatives to, yeah, everything ends up on the floor, but make excellent alternatives to lint-free wipes. So we're gonna do uh, the, you know, 17th phase of block cleaning here before we start on the rough assembly and uh, start on our measurements and everything because I've got my crank back, took it for a walk. Oh wait, no, it's not a 4G63. Anyway, got it back from the machine shop and uh, 10 under and they were able to get good bearing surfaces on both the mains and the rods. And I've got the rods back, got them all cleaned up and resized on the big end. And I even had them polish up the cam for me just to make sure that uh, delicious Truck Norris cam stays in good shape. Although frankly, it didn't really show any meaningful wear. But time to do some more cleaning, some cleaning, then some cleaning, then cleaning, then cleaning again, and then measuring. And then I'll take it apart so I can clean it, maybe measure it, and then clean it. There we go, hopefully you can see that. It's a nice uh, thousandth and a half. He's similar there. 
And there. There. And there. Maybe even closer to the thousandth side on that one. All right. Main clearances look good. Nothing quite so fun as plastic aging over and over and over again, but you know, better safe than sorry. Still looking good. My rods are also turned at 10 under, so getting all these journals in with new bearings. Uh, also obviously had the big ends of the rods cleaned up, resized, remachined. Well, I've rotated the engine over a couple times by hand, heard a sound that did not sound right. Sound was probably this. Oil control ring got out of position and bent up going in. And predictably has destroyed the bore of the cylinder. And if you can hear the emergency vehicles in the distance, they are almost certainly coming for me. Yeah, that's, that's trash. That's not coming out by hand. That's gonna need to be bored out. We need new pistons, new rings, starting the whole thing over. Flawless plan. So we are now on attempt three to do this quick budget rebuild after having the crank turned and the rods resized now we've had the block board out too and it honed professionally punched out to 20 over everything cleaned up at that size and of course you know when you punch the block out you got to get different pistons so now my budget rebuild reusing as many stock parts with a you know tricky ricky razor blade rebuild now involves new pistons but when i say new pistons i went we'll call it uh stone auto and in those search parameters, I said, I want your finest, cheapest pistons for flat top LQ9 high compression six liter. And I got them. So we have here the beautiful box of the finest pistons and rings that $200 could buy. Come on, come on, come on. There we go. Yeah, they don't. They don't look awesome, but uh, they are new pistons and they are the right size. And of course, uh, my stock rods reconditioned still. And uh, the machine shop also checked out the, the pin bushings, made sure that they fit okay on the new uh, wrist pins and they're fine. Uh, no significant wear on these wrist pin bushings. So those are good to go. Some of you are yelling at your phones right now like, Whoa. It's an LS, just go grab another one from the junkyard. Why are you bothering to get it machined and do all this extra work? Well, I'll tell you why. First of all, this is a six liter and it's the flat top piston LQ9. These are not really super duper common. They're not in every junkyard. Second, you know, these are not, if you could find one, like they're not 500 bucks. That's kind of not a thing anymore. The ones that I have found have been you know, 1,200, 13, 1,400 bucks, and they had 200,000 miles on them already. So I would also want to be kind of tearing into them and freshening things up and making sure they were okay. Anyway, if I'm gonna to go to all the work of putting it in. Fourthly, a point C, Q, niner, is that uh, so far this mistake, while stupid and avoidable and painful to behold, it's 300 bucks in machine work and 200 bucks worth of pistons. So it's a $500 mistake. Does it suck? Yes. Is it avoidable? Yes. But also, like, I think this actually was my cheapest option to just go with this. Because as Abraham Lincoln said, if you make a bad bargain, hug it all the tighter. I don't think this is what he meant. Anyway, let's get started cleaning and then cleaning. And then maybe we'll clean some stuff. And maybe, maybe clean things like two more, two more times. Yeah. So filing rings to set the correct end gap. Well, you know, the right way to do it, you put it in the bore, 
you push it down with the piston to make sure that everything's nice and even. It's part way down to the bore. You take a measurement of the gap. Then you take it over to the little ring filer over there, you know, and you grind it a little bit, bring it back, measure it again, check it, grind it a little more, go back, measure it, grind it. And you keep repeating that process so you can really sneak up on the measurement. You don't want to go, you know, overboard and make too big of a gap. <laughs> the wrong way to do it is to take rings that you just bought that you've never worked with this brand before, take that first measurement, and then grind pretty aggressively because you've done this before and you know about how much it takes to remove that material. Because apparently these rings are quite a bit softer than what I'm used to. And so my first ring, uh, I'm shooting for 28 thousandths. Yes, I'm gapping them for boost. No, I'm not going to boost it right now. Stop looking at me that way. Anyway, using your calibrated eyeball, I'm sure you can tell <laughs> this is not... 28 thousandths of an inch. <laughs> this is like, this is like a quarter of an inch. This is like 25 hundredths. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that one is, that one's trash. As is my aim. So I've had to wait a week or so to get another set of rings so I can grind this one properly and uh, finish this up. Another flawless plan. Okay, for those of you keeping score at home, this is engine rebuild number three. Ready to go back in, I think. So a quick summary. We've got a brand new GM Performance oil pump. We've got brand new 20 over pistons. The block has been punched out 20 thousandths over. Uh, brand new rings. We've got reconditioned rods. We've got a ground crank. We're 10 under on the crank and the rods. And uh, everything has been plastic gauged. All the crank and rod journals, double checked all of them. They all checked out really good, both on the mic and on the plastic gauge during assembly. We've got, uh, I replaced these oil lines last time, so they were brand new, but I have flushed them extensively. The entire thing <laughs> has been washed and cleaned multiple times. So the block obviously was washed out by the machine shop. I also wiped it down like three or four times and uh, primarily using the coffee filters. Coffee filters and brake cleaner, lots of those. Also blew everything off with air, double, triple checking that I'm not leaving any fibrous materials anywhere. That stuff, I believe, is all good. Pistons went in, everything was liberally coated with uh, oil. I used mostly like a high zinc diesel 1540 oil uh, during assembly of the pistons and rods and stuff. And then I used my typical assembly lube on, on everything else. Cam is in, lifters are in. Uh, we've also got brand new lifters from Melling. Uh, the push rods checked out, everything was good there for length. My seals and gaskets were new last time. So front and rear mains, uh, oil pan, front cover, rear cover, that stuff was all good. So I'm just reusing that stuff. It wasn't leaking before and it was all brand new. It has 50 miles on it. The head gaskets are new. The exhaust manifold gaskets are new because it turns out the Felpro exhaust manifold gaskets I was using, like even 50 miles, you can't reuse those. They're kind of a fibrous material with a metal insert and they just fall apart on removal. So this time I got MLS gaskets for the exhaust, so they should be reusable. The front pulley was already new from last time. Everything good to go there. The oil pickup tube is the same, but I cleaned and cleaned and cleaned and cleaned that and then cleaned it some more. That thing is cleaner than it was at the factory when it was brand new. So oil pickup tube is good to go. All of the oil galleries and stuff in the block, everything's been cleaned out. I ran um, like pipe cleaner type stuff through all of the crank journals, through the oil passages in the block, flushed everything with brake, brake cleaner as part of the cleanup. All that stuff has been uh, very carefully and very heavily cleaned. I also, you know, the heads, I never did have them rebuilt. Uh, Really, I had no complaints about them. They were in decent shape. And the, uh, I had no evidence that it was leaking from the head gasket surface or anything during my 50 miles or so that I drove it. 
So just fresh gaskets on those and fresh bolts, but otherwise that stuff's the same. I washed out the heads as well to make sure that any, you know, uh, crappy engine oil residue was rinsed out of them. But yeah, so the heads have been cleaned out well. They still have the brand new valve seals in them. And then I had, again, mostly I've been really happy with Felpro stuff in the past, but I had Felpro valve cover gaskets. And one of them, as I was just kind of wiping it off to reinstall, stretched out horribly and I could not refit it. Uh, so whatever that silicone rubber is that that valve cover gasket was made out of, it decided to stretch and then, then you're done. You can't really stick it back in there. So had to buy a new valve cover gasket, but I think we're good to go there. My exhaust manifold bolts, I bought all new last time. So those are still in very good nick. And uh, there was a couple new sensors I did last time. So that stuff's all good to go as well. I'm leaving the valley cover off for now. That'll go in once I drop the motor in the car. Oh, yeah, I think it's good to go. I'm gonna have a couple friends over tomorrow night and we're hopefully gonna get this thing jammed back in the truck, find out how it works. Uh, giving it the best effort here. I think this is gonna be okay, but uh, <laughs> I've made so many mistakes on this one so far, I cannot afford to keep doing this. I really need to drive this thing. I also need to stop pouring money into it. Although, frankly, you know, this is the only engine family that you could be doing this many stupid mistakes on and having to redo this many things and do it as cheaply as I have. <sighs> it's terrible to make all these stupid mistakes, but this is a pretty cheap way to do it. Let's just hope that this flawless plan is the last one I need for a bit on this truck. So for reference, the temperature while I was doing the engine swap the first time was 104 degrees. Doing it this time, 15 degrees. Oh yeah. Anyway, I cranked it a good 10 seconds per run, probably six, seven times now, but with the plugs in, and that was with no fuel pump, um, uh, no fuel pump relay connected at all. So I'm gonna do a couple cycles here to prime the fuel system, and we're just gonna send it here. We're gonna fire it and see what happens. Again here. Nope. Well, that went well. So <laughs> as you just saw in that video, a few evenings ago after getting the motor in, uh, I cranked it, cranked it, cranked it with the fuel pump uh, fuse out, tried to get it to prime up and generate some oil pressure with no success. Then decided after doing some reading, well, maybe what I need to do is just fire it up and let it get a few more RPMs and it'll build oil pressure, which is actually what it did the first time I rebuilt the motor and was fine. Like it, it fired and built oil pressure right away. <clears throat> Pretty much exactly like every other engine I've rebuilt in the past has done. Um, certainly when I've had the opportunity on a lot of engines, you know, to spin the oil pump and generate pressure first or crank it for a while to generate pressure first, you always want to take that opportunity. Uh, but on the LS, apparently that is not working for me so far. So another piece of LS learning has been, you know, this idea of pre-lubing the motor. And since you can't just take the old school small block Chevy approach of spinning the oil pump directly through the distributor shaft, what you can do is you can force feed it oil through the side of the block. But I had to get an adapter, this little, little guy here to go from the M16 threads down to like an eighth NPT so I can get a hose stuck on it. So we're gonna attempt this. We're going to try to get that rigged up. Of course, now that the motor's in the car and has the entire front uh, power steering bracket assembly put on there, getting to that plug is not the easiest thing in the world. Um, <clears throat> but with that, and then with this old hacked up garden sprayer that like 20 years ago, I added a pressure gauge to and some other stuff to use as a brake bleeding tool. I think we're gonna keep modifying that and find a way, hopefully, to force feed oil into this thing. And then we're gonna cross our fingers that the five seconds or so that I ran it uh, were protected by the assembly lube and the pre-oiling and everything that I had in there before uh, from during the engine build. And then I didn't spin bearings and do other crap in this motor again. Yeah, here's hoping. Okay, so 
I have my handy garden sprayer hooked up here and plugged in, connected to a little adapter on the side of the block. See it down there? No? Yeah, me neither. It's impossible to see. <laughs> it's not the easiest thing to get to. Can't even tighten it with a wrench. There's no room for a wrench down there or a socket or anything. So it's just finger tight. But all we're really trying to do is force feed a little oil into the side of the pump. I did note that the oil filter was full of oil. So it was pumping something in my attempts before. I have also removed all but one of the spark plugs. That one's annoying, so I didn't take that one out. Um, but it should turn over much more easily. And I've removed this valve cover so that I can watch for uh, oil to pump up into the head as my visual cue that, you know, must have oil circulation if it's actually pumped up into the head. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a little pressure by pumping up on my garden sprayer just a little bit. Not, not a lot. Um, number one, because none of my little connections here are going to hold very much pressure. Number two, because I'm not trying to get a whole lot. And then my wife is going to crank it over for me. We'll see see what it does. Okay, after seven or eight more uh, rounds of pumping about 20 PSI and then cranking the engine over three or four revolutions, uh, we are actually getting oil to top into the motor. It's not real obvious maybe, but I definitely have it coming up out of the push rods. And maybe if you see it long enough here, you'll catch a drip coming off of one of the valve springs. But you can see there's a decent amount of oil there. So it's definitely pumping, at least with me supplying the pressure externally via the Home Depot special here. Interestingly, we verified on the gauge inside the truck that it is showing, you know, 20 to 40 PSI while cranking. Again, you know, certainly some of that being provided by this guy right here, but that tells me the gauge and the sending unit and stuff are fine. The wiring is fine. That stuff was all working before, but I was obviously concerned about whether I was getting a bad reading from the sending unit. And uh, I don't think I was because I'm getting a reading now. And it does appear that I have pressure. I'm going to keep doing this a little bit more. And then I think I'm probably going to try disconnecting my external pressure feed here and see if it will still pump oil up here um, without me providing the pressure into it. If it does, I might button things back up and try to fire it up and see what happens. Okay, so after putting the plug back in and cranking it over, verifying I am getting some oil pumping up through the push rods during cranking, and on the dash, you be so kind as to crank it for me one more time. We are getting what looks like oil pressure, even while cranking. Oh, I think that's a good thing. Time to button this engine up and probably out of time for today, but uh, hopefully get it fired up here sometime soon and see if it actually makes pressure on its own while it's running. And so obviously, as I'm putting it back together, for the first time in 25 years, I cross-threaded a spark plug. <laughs> you know how many spark plugs I've put into aluminum heads? It's not that complicated. <laughs> like, <laughs> doing this my entire life. Use anti-seize. Spin it down by hand. Torque it by hand. Don't use power tools. Like, the rules are pretty simple. And if you follow them, you're not going to cross-thread or screw up the threads in an aluminum head with a spark plug. I swear I didn't cut those corners. I thought for sure I had it spun down by hand. Came in by hand with the wrench to tighten it down. Immediately was obvious that, like, it was cross-threaded. Still have absolutely no idea how I did it. It must have been off, like when I spun it down by hand, it must not have actually been in the hole, is my only thought. But, yeah, no idea. So, as usual, this project is trying pretty hard to weld itself to the driveway. And uh, now we get to cut some new spark plug threads, put an insert in the head, make sure that everything gets completely cleaned out of the combustion chamber, I will probably, I guess I'm a little thankful that it's um, relatively easy to reach. It's the first one on the passenger side here. Uh, but I will probably still need to drop the exhaust manifold because there's just not enough room to get tools in there. Um, and make sure that at the correct angle going into the hole. So 
pull the manifold, make sure I'm on the compression stroke, ream it out, clean everything out of the combustion chamber real carefully, make sure I don't leave anything inside. And then hopefully, hopefully this thing's ready to start. Well, that went well. So I grabbed this little kit from the parts store with what is supposedly both a reamer and a tap in one. So instructions are to not pre-drill out the hole, but instead just, you know, drive this on through the existing spark plug hole to both ream out the aluminum and cut new threads. That was a complete disaster. I've done this two or three other times in the past with a different style tool or one that did have you pre-drill and worked just fine, was able to get inserts in and, and have no big issues. This was a complete disaster. It would not ream enough to actually, you know, bite and cut threads at the same time. And so what ends up happening is it ends up like, you know, catching material on the threads and because it won't drive in and ream more, it just spits that material out and you end up not cutting good threads, especially in the top half of the hole. So what I'm left with, you know, they kind of look like threads in there, but they are not, not good enough to actually even engage with the threaded insert. So when putting this in, only the bottom couple of threads even really catch with any kind of force. So you can tell by the fact that I've taken the head off how well that went. Not great, not great. Uh, basically, I have ruined this head because uh, to drill out again and then use like a thicker insert or something like the machine shop did not even have anything on the shelf handy insert wise that would take up that size difference. Unbelievably, and at this point, I really have to say a gigantic thank you to Joe at CarQuest Machine. So uh, CarQuest Machine here in Lincoln, Nebraska, not sponsored, not paid, not affiliated in any way, just a happy customer. I've been taking stuff to them for uh, 15, 18 years now, at least. <laughs> and uh, they've probably done like three dozen cylinder heads for me over the years, you know, surfacing, rebuilding, valve jobs, replacements, etc. A couple engine blocks and stuff too, some other, you know, pistons and stuff they've done for me over the years. Never given me a single reason to complain. So I've always been happy with them. Today I'm over there explaining my, 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 my tale of woe and how I screwed this thing up again. Yet another unforced error on this stupid, stupid project. <sighs> and uh, Joe says to me, oh, are they just, are they stock heads? I'm like, yeah, it's like, they're just 317 heads. Like, I know they're not exactly falling out of trees, but they exist. So I suppose I probably should just get another head rather than try to fix this one. And he said, yeah. And he said, actually, I, I think I have some, if you like one. So miracle of miracles. <laughs> same day service i walked out with a perfectly good used serviceable head um, to use instead of my existing ones i've got another uh you know fresh really no special work has been done here but it's just a good used head which he gave me for a very very reasonable price and all i've got to do now is switch over all of my btr springs uh valve seals uh, i think that's it i'm going to need a new spark plug for the one that's got the thread screwed up on it and a new set of head bolts and uh, some other things. But at least now, I think, I can get back on track relatively quickly to get this head put on the motor. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, after a couple more late night sessions out here in the cold in the driveway, the new used head is on. Uh, everything is pretty much buttoned up in here except the cooling system. I haven't Put the fan back on and haven't filled anything with coolant. I have the fuel pump relay and the ignition relay out and I have cranked it several times. Uh, I believe like three or four times. So it's been it's been several days since I did the external pressurizing and I took the head off in between those. Obviously some extensive cleaning and such along with that as well. But after like three long cranks, you know, like 10, 15 seconds per cranking session uh, on the fourth when I started building pressure. Here, so let's try it again, see if we still are. Yeah. So like almost 40 PSI while cranking. I'm very happy about that. 
Okay, here we go. First fire up. No coolant. Lots of oil in the sump. Probably still a quart and a half or two quarts over full. Hopefully that was a fuel priming issue. Oh buddy, look at that oil pressure. Certainly sounds okay. Okay, oil change after maybe like 30 minutes of idling, kind of warming it up and bleeding the coolant out, and then uh, maybe 10 miles of driving over the last couple days. So, you know, it didn't look too bad coming out, but I don't know if you'll be able to see it on camera, but it's a little sparkly. The magnetic drain plug had just a little bit of material on it, but, you know, only really the rings would be, uh, you know, magnetic. Only That's the only ferrous metal that would be wearing. The rest of it would be bearing material. I don't know. This is more bearing material in the oil than I normally see after a rebuild. Not crazy about this. Uh, and then cat, I caught some of it coming out in this water bottle. It's pretty cloudy, pretty dark. There's quite a bit of metal in there. I don't know, not super encouraged by this, but I'll put fresh oil in it, fresh filter, run it some more, see how it looks, see if it starts dropping off, or if I've trashed another engine. So this was that first sample after about, you know, 10 miles of driving, 30 some minutes of idle time, warming things up and whatever. Looks pretty bad, and when I had it, you know, when I what had drained into the pan, there was obviously a lot of bearing material in it not encouraging. I filled it with oil, uh, drove it like a mile, and then took a sample out again. And you can see like it's not as bad. Um, hard to tell if there's metal in it or not. I sent a sample of this to Blackstone. Haven't heard back yet. This is that same oil about 30 or 40 miles later, did some more driving. You can see it's, you know, it's a little darker. Not sure if that's anything to really be concerned about. I don't, I don't see a lot of metal in it. It's, it's air bubbles mostly I'm seeing right now, but, um, and also what's in the pan after the drain out doesn't look like it's completely full of metal. The magnetic drain plug, the tip of that plug is magnetic and it did not have a lot of material on it. Very, very small amount of sludge. You're always gonna have some, especially some ferrous material from the rings during break-in, which I would definitely still be within break-in period. Super high quality oil filter here too. I'll keep that and maybe cut it open later. Anyway, so uh, I'm gonna fill it up with oil again. It does still run just fine. I don't know. Don't know if this is saved or not. So my current very optimistic, hopeful theory, which might be a stretch, is that maybe despite the fact that I flushed everything very carefully, so the block, everything was washed out, um, you know, heads I flushed out, rinsed out, the oil cooler I rinsed out, the oil lines, everything got rinsed out, flushed out. But maybe there was still some residual sludge from before, and maybe that's what's coming out, and maybe it's the old bearing material from the previous failure still coming out in the oil. I don't know. I have a lot of optimism in that, but that's what I'm hoping for. And right now I'm more willing to spend money on cheap oil, uh, changing it every few miles than I am pulling this motor out again. So we'll see how this does. And uh, depending on what comes back from Blackstone, I might send them like another sample of this next change because if my theory is correct, I would expect to see like dramatically dropping levels of bearing material in the oil um, with these short changes. So some weeks later, I have the results back from Blackstone and basically to summarize, they told me to stop being a pansy and drive it. Now, the good news is that the levels of metal in the oil are not that high, actually even lower than the average. However, you know, I only ran this oil for like one mile. So uh, it might be a little artificially low since the oil hasn't even had time to pick up everything that the motor might have to put out, shall we say. But I think this is enough for me to go ahead and drive it some more. 
get some more samples later on and fingers crossed that this thing may yet live. I'll just say that I have so much confidence that it's okay that I bought another car. Yeah. Thanks for watching. See you next time.